this low-lying car I drive in, I've been noticing something lately. When I'm sitting in traffic, I either can't see past the cars in front of me or the cars around me are towering over me. And it turns out there's a big reason for that. The production of passenger cars like sedans and wagons for sale in the U.S. has been in free fall since 1975. And in their place has been the steady growth in the production of SUVs. Last year, SUVs and trucks made up 80% of all new car sales. Compare that to 52% in 2011. The fact that Americans like big cars probably won't shock anyone. They are everywhere, even in my parking scarce neighborhood in Brooklyn. But the reasons behind this transformation are more than just cultural. It all goes back to a 50-year-old policy that would kick off a huge shift in the way U.S. cars are designed. So I'm driving from my home in Brooklyn, New York to a beach in Rhode Island for a summer vacation. And along the way, I'm going to piece together why big cars took over America. New York was the 45th state to officially succumb to the takeover of SUVs and trucks in 2014, according to this Washington Post analysis. Alaska was the first state to go big car dominant in 1988. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for things I should look out for while I'm on the road. Anywhere that you stop, count the number of SUVs versus the number of passenger cars. Okay, we're in the Costco parking lot, filled with SUVs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven SUVs in a row. I think that is my new record. So once you learn about how much big cars dominate the road, it's like you can't unsee it. People have lots of reasons for choosing a big car, and certainly the infrastructure in the U.S. supports that choice. Unlike a lot of other countries, our built environment revolves around cars. We have wide roads and wide, plentiful parking spaces and homes with plenty of parking. I arrived in Connecticut, a state that succumbed to light truck dominance in 2016, and pulled into a rest stop where I interviewed Thomas Bochenek, who was on a cross-country road trip with his wife. It's very comfortable. Okay, the drive. Well, I think the bigger the car, the more you, you have a feeling of security. You know, the smaller the car, you know, the, the more likely I think about getting into an accident and being hurt. It has no trouble pulling this almost 7,000 pound trailer. In other countries, one deterrent for big cars is that they cost so much to fill up with gas. But due to low taxes on gas in the U.S., fuel is extremely cheap compared to other countries. But there's another overlooked bias towards big cars related to why SUVs exist in the first place. In the 1970s, there was a shortage of foreign oil in the U.S. 1973 dramatized U.S. dependence on foreign oil. So the U.S. government set rules for automakers to start making cars more fuel efficient to lessen our dependence on the whims of the global oil market. By 1985, new cars had to get 27.5 miles per gallon, or roughly double their fuel efficiency. These new rules applied to cars, like sedans and station wagons, under a category known as passenger cars. But there were types of vehicles the U.S. government exempted from these rules, things like pickup trucks, which everyday drivers weren't really driving at the time. And the idea was, if these are working vehicles used by you know, farmers, construction crews, companies that are hauling freight, those vehicles need to be able to do their job without being choked by emissions controls and without being held to unrealistic fuel economy standards. So passenger cars got one set of strict rules, and this other category, called light trucks, got another set of more relaxed standards. This regulation created an incentive for car makers to transform light trucks into a vehicle for everyday use. Put in a radio, lots of cargo space, and comfy seats, and... Voila, that's how we got the SUV. Okay, girls, we're off in our new Jeep Cherokee. Because behind that classic appearance, it's rugged and powerful. An automaker needs to spend less money and less time on fuel economy and emissions improvement if they're making and selling an SUV because it falls under a category that is less stringently regulated. We had the Wagoneer, but it was very low volume, very bespoke, very expensive. So only a very few people bought it. People that lived in Manhattan would go to the Hamptons or go to northern New York State to go skiing. 
And that's how the SUV started off life. This is Ralph Gilles, head of design at Stellantis, a conglomerate of car companies that includes Jeep. One of the early SUVs was the Chevy Blazer, built on the frame of the Chevy S10 truck. This is the traditional definition of an SUV, if it was built on the frame of a truck. And to meet the legal definition of a light truck, it had to have some clearance angles and dimensions just right. Taking a utilitarian vehicle and turning it into a uh, almost a premium luxury device that happened to be utilitarian. Then comes the Grand Cherokee. The Jeep Grand Cherokee was built the way passenger cars are, in one piece, or unibody. These two types of car constructions, frame-based and unibody, today form the distinction between traditional SUVs and the new, increasingly popular category of crossover. They're more efficiently packaged, you don't have the frame. The Grand Cherokee was part of the early success story of SUVs in the 90s and 2000s, one that continues today. This bias towards light trucks is why a company like Volkswagen, which once sold primarily passenger cars, has discontinued a lot of them today, like the Passat, in favor of SUVs and crossovers. And they've stopped producing all of their wagons, including the Jetta wagon I'm in. And a company like Ford has stopped producing all of their passenger cars except for the iconic Mustang. Okay, I'm gonna see if anyone at this car dealership will talk to me. Buick was always car, really. It was mostly sedans. And then just with the market shift, we actually don't even sell a Buick sedan anymore. They don't even make a Buick sedan. It's all it's all ass crossovers. When was the last time you guys carried like a Buick passenger car? Uh, it was like three or four years ago. And how many did you have on the lot? Like one to a hundred of S, you know SUVs. We're here to sell cars, but we want to sell what people want. If they were here and people didn't want them, I'm glad they're not here anymore, you know? <laughs> So this chart starts to make a lot more sense. 1975 was the year these fuel economy standards for stands and wagons were passed, the same ones that didn't apply as strictly to SUVs and trucks. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing because the automakers have been marketing SUVs more preferentially than passenger cars. They've been putting more research and development into creating more models that fit into the SUV category. And they've made it so that it's an easier decision to get into an SUV than it is to get into a passenger car. As of 2016, our fuel economy standards shifted Vehicles are still separated by the stricter standard for passenger cars and looser standard for light trucks. But within those categories, there are more breakdowns. Regulators multiply a car's wheelbase length by its width to get a footprint. And larger cars within each category get weaker rules. That means that car makers are not only incentivized to phase out passenger cars in their fleet, but they are pushed to make each category bigger. The Toyota Camry got both longer and wider, and the Toyota RAV4 did too. I've now reached Rhode Island, the very last state in the country to go light truck dominant. We have started the inevitable transition to electric vehicles, but... If you're still talking about a larger vehicle with higher ground clearance that's heavier and taller, it's still going to be less energy efficient, whether it's an electric car or an internal combustion powered car. One sobering impact of big cars is the threat it poses to pedestrians. One study found that replacing the growth in SUVs with cars would have averted over a thousand pedestrian deaths. People on foot get hit higher and in more vulnerable regions when hit by an SUV or a truck rather than a passenger car. Before hitting the beach, I stopped at my friend Kevin Wright's house. He's bucked the SUV trend and drives a Honda Fit, a car that was discontinued in 2020. We had our daughter about 17 months ago. It's just kind of making sure that Everybody has enough space to be comfortable, as well as being safe. It gets good gas mileage and thinking about long-term, you know, climate change is happening. What can we do to minimize our carbon footprint as much as we can? So we were thinking about a second car, you know, maybe getting an SUV in that situation, but ultimately decided to kind of go the other direction and, and got an e-bike. You have arrived. Even though we're in Rhode Island, which was the last holdout for SUV dominance, there is still a lot of SUVs here. I'm curious if you think there's any political will or urgency to change this trend towards bigger cars. 
you know, that's something that's uh, that has environmental concerns. It's something that has economic concerns with how much we are reliant on oil. It also has to do with safety, you know, pedestrian safety, cyclist safety. So there is a desire among younger people and more politically active people to try to make it so that an SUV is not the default vehicle choice for American families. The U.S. is unlikely to become a small car country anytime soon. But this dramatic transition to big cars wasn't just about consumer choice. It was enabled by policy choice. So if we want our roads to look different, we could try and start there. <laughs>